Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. This is going to be part three in my Dumble ODS build extravaganza. This has been a super fun and also frustrating build. I actually was hoping that I wouldn't need to make part three. Part three, two, I really dove deep into the build itself, the initial build process. Part one, I dove into the schematic. And so part three, we're going to focus on those finishing touches to get the thing kind of perfected and sounding its very best. So uh, if you're interested in that, go ahead and stay tuned. Let's dive in. this part three I wanted to thank you very much for tuning in if you're interested in more uh, tube amp videos like this please subscribe leave a comment down below on what you think about this uh, question of the day is uh, what kind of schematic review would you like to see from me next is there a amplifier schematic that I haven't gone through yet that you'd really love to see please leave a comment down below and tell me what you'd like to uh, me to go through in some depth and detail and try to give you some insight on if you're interested in supporting me, help make more videos like this, please check out some of the links down in the description. I've got a number of different ways you can support me all down there uh, between uh, a tip jar, buying some merchandise, or supporting me through some Amazon affiliate links. Whatever floats your boat and whatever works best for you and your life, please uh, just consider supporting me in any which way. And even just watching this video and commenting really adds a lot, and I really appreciate what you have to offer. So let's go ahead and dive in. Where we left off last... I got the Dumble up and running, which was a big step. Always really excited about that. But you never really know when you get to that stage how much more work is going to be done to get it from an amp that simply amplifies to kind of getting it to the point where you were hoping that it would get the dream or the allure. You, know, you don't build an ODS simply to make your signal louder. You build it to do that particular ODS thing. And so you, also with this being an unknown build, I'd never done anything like this before. I used an unknown layout. I even used an unknown schematic. There were definitely a lot of uncertainties facing this build as I moved forward. But I think it's important to just take it one step at a time. So in the spirit of one step at a time, let's just walk through the steps that I took. Uh, the first thing that I identified was the need to set bias correctly. Setting the bias on the output stage is really critical. In this amp, I had installed EL84s, and I had set them up for adjustable fixed bias. So I actually had a potentiometer that I could turn that would adjust the bias. And on the cathodes, I installed two 1-ohm resistors that uh, if you put your multimeter set for DC volts on the cathode, because there's 1-ohm of resistance through Ohm's law, if you run the calculation there, that means that 1 millivolt of DC voltage equals one milliamp of current. So uh, it's a really neat and, and clean and simple way to try to adjust your bias. Now, the first problem I ran into is you really wanna check those bias resistors and measure them. And unfortunately, my one ohm resistors, the pack that I've got, uh, the tolerance isn't real great. And I actually, they measured at about 1.5 and 1.6 ohms. So that's probably too much. If it was maybe 10%, like 1.1 or even 0.9, that probably would be fine. There's, you know, the multimeter itself is probably going to have some variance. And so, you know, a margin of error, so to speak. And so 1.6, though, is a little bit too big. That's about a 60, 63% uh, difference. Now, you can still do some math in there, you know, so whatever the number it gives you, you can just multiply by 63%, but it still is pretty annoying. But I really don't have a better way to do it. Uh, you can, on the other hand, uh, measure the resistance of the output transformer. Uh, if you think about the signal coming from both of the plates of the tubes going into the output transformer, there is some DC resistance there that you can use to measure the plate current. But uh, I just went ahead and did the conversion based on my cathode current. And the initial results that I got were not good. First of all, my voltage was really high. On initial startup, I'm spiking up to about 500 volts DC right off of the rectifier. Uh, the two, the solid state rectifier. And so that's really, really high. And it was coming down, leveling off at about 455 volts, but it was also being a little bit unstable, meaning it would kind of slowly bleed down. It wasn't 
kind of steady state. Uh, and just the way it was functioning was very odd. And then second, the current that I was getting was really, really high. I was reading on the multimeter something in the range of like 0.8 to 0.7 to 0.8, which is really, really high. I was hoping to get my um, current, and I, and I based this this hopeful number on Rob Robernet's tube amp bias calculator. Check, I'll have a link down in the description for you guys to check out. It's an awesome website to determine bias, but you just plug in your tubes, which I've got JJ EL84s for about 12 watts. You plug in your plate voltage, which is, was in my case really, really high. Um, and then you plug in your current and that gives you your wattage. And I was probably pushing about 30 to 35 watts per, you know, so which is way, you know, you're looking for about 12. Uh, so it was just way, way too high. Um, the, even the plate voltage was really, really high, which is going to create a problem. You know, EL84s probably want to be more in like the 350 range. I think you might see some amps that run on about 400, but uh, 450 to 500 is way, way too hot. So um, something wasn't right. And what I discovered upon closer inspection was my power transformer. The lettering on the side was a little bit scuffed off. And so actually um, I had incorrectly numbered my power transformer. So I want to say if whatever I thought was a six was actually a five. But basically what that means is instead of it being an 18 watt, like a Marshall 18 watt style, power transformer, which might have like 275 volts on the secondary. It actually was a deluxe reverb style power transformer, which is meant to feed a tube rectifier into six V sixes. So I'm actually getting more like 325 volts on the secondary. So I was about 50 volts high just on the secondary side of the power transformer before rectification. So that was a pretty big problem. When I ran into this problem, um, I think I had a couple different options. One, I could try and drop the voltage pretty significantly. You could use a tube rectifier. You could use Zener diodes. But um, I really wasn't that interested in doing that. It would have been kind of a tight... I think I would have had room to put in a tube rectifier, but for this Dumble style amp, I, I wasn't that wasn't the response and the feel that I was looking for. I wanted the firm and tight feel of the solid-state diodes. And the Zener diodes are also not a great solution when you've got to drop that much voltage. It's really going to affect the sag and the feel of the amp as well. So I wasn't really wishing to do that. Another option was would be to uh, swap out the power tubes. So a EL84 has a 9-pin socket, which is the same as a 12AX7, but really any of the other commonly used power tubes run off of an 8-pin socket. And so I decided that that was the route I wanted to go down. Now, that might compromise my output transformer, which is rated for about 15 to 20 watts. And it's, um, I want to say it was like a 6.6K. Uh, it's a Hammond uh, 1750PA, I believe is the uh, model. It's meant for EL84s, for a Marshall 18 watt. Now, the wattage wasn't really the problem, but it, the, um, the secondary impedance was really what I was looking at. And if you get the impedance too far off, it's not going to mate well with the tubes. Now, I think that I took a look in 6v6s, it looks like, I want to say they were maybe hoping for something in the range of about 6K. So it was only maybe 2 or 3K of a difference, which I think is probably close enough for rock and roll, so to speak. So I personally was comfortable making that change. And with 6v6s, especially the JJ 6v6s, they're a little bit more capable of handling up to 450 or 500 volts. They're really kind of baby 6L6s. And I've got a, I've had a lot of experience working with those in the past. So that was the route I ended up going with. I needed to drill the holes, enlarge the holes, and install the 8-pin uh, tube sockets. And then I just, everything else I just wired up. Now the, the pin layout is a little bit different, but it really wasn't such a terrible change to make. So... That fixed that problem, but I really wasn't out of the woods just yet. Next, I still, I went to bias the amp again, and I still was getting too much current. All right, I went back to the drawing board a little bit, and we're gonna focus on this resistor right here. In my bias circuit, the 50 volt line comes right here on this yellow wire. And this is my basically my step down resistor, which goes into a filter capacitor. Now, I've got 466 ohms, and 
basically the problem is that my bias is too high and so I'm getting too much current flowing through the tube in order to bring that down even at the minimum level of my bias pot right here there isn't enough negative DC voltage to create a low enough appropriate bias so what we need to do is increase the amount of negative DC voltage so maybe if right now if I'm getting you know on, on the on the grids if I'm getting maybe negative 35 volts maybe negative 45 I need to get it up to negative 55 or negative 60 so in order to do that we need to decrease the value of this resistor to allow more signal to come through to drive the grid more negative so that the bias of the tube goes down so if we're at 466 ohms I think I've got two choices. Uh, one option would be to find another uh, 470 ohm resistor and run it in parallel. Or another option might be to try something like this. This is a 360 ohm 5 watt resistor. Or maybe even something even lower than that. If I can find one, like a a little bag of resistors here. Maybe even like a 250 ohm. Here's 330. So something lower is basically what I need. Um, I think what I'm going to try to do is jumper in another 270. And I'm sorry, another 470. So I believe that would be this. These look to be the same to me. So we're going to try jumping that in and see what we see. Let's give it a shot. All right, I have two resistors piggybacking now, two 470 ohms in parallel, giving me 235, 234 ohms. I've got my load box plugged in. Um, I am wanting now to check... Let's put the ground leg down here, and let's just follow, uh, we'll start with AC volts, let's follow the voltage from this node. So again, this node right here is coming off of the power supply. It should be a 50 volt DC tap. Let's see, turn the amp on, there goes my pilot light. So you can see almost instantly we get 53.5 volts AC. Let's track it here. Now to the next node. So after those two dropping resistors, it goes down to 42 volts AC. Now let's see what we get right here. This is coming out of the pot, out of the bias pot. 12, about 12 volts there if I go all the way to the minimum side to negative 25 volts. So now I actually want to check my cathode. That gives me 84, but I believe that I checked that my resistors are not accurate. So I don't think that's going to actually give me an accurate measurement. So let's see what happens when I sweep my pot. Still seems way off. I might need to even do more. Check back. At about this time, I also noticed two additional problems. One is I was getting a lot of buzz and hum. Now, even till now, I think some of it may be related to the pink Telecaster I've got. I think there's maybe a grounding issue there, which I need to look into. I also suspect some of my guitar cables. I've had a lot of trouble with some of my old guitar cables failing, and I've been installing new tips and still kind of working out my best process for that. So I wasn't 100% certain what was going on there, but... Still, it felt like the noise, especially with my single coil guitars, was really, really bad. And then second, I started getting um, a ghosting effect. But the best way that I can explain it is that, first of all, the tone just sounds a little bit muddier than what I would expect. The, there's not a lot of clarity to the tone in maybe a way that's hard to put your finger on. There's also kind of like a, 
Like you have your primary signal, which sounded good and responded good like normal, but then there was almost like a ring modulator or almost a Octavia or a chorusing or like an 80s detuning type effect that was sitting underneath the primary signal and just kind of rubbing against it. And it was especially apparent if I would roll the guitar volume back and play signal note, single notes in the middle of the fretboard. You could really hear as the note would kind of sustain, there would be like this weird lower pitch interference kind of thing. It almost kind of sounded like Cookie Monster's voice and it felt really strange. Which is really frustrating because the primary signal sounded amazing, but that rubbing against it just kind of kept it from being very clear. And this ghosting effect really was driving me completely nuts. Just super frustrated with the ghosting effect. The efforts to troubleshoot the Dumbo are ongoing. I'm still having troubles with the ghosting and I have done quite a lot to try to fix it. I'm kind of losing track to be honest at this point, but I've added a number of lengths of shielded cable. The negative feedback is currently removed. I have double checked some of the wiring layout stuff in this area and just am not currently having any luck getting this figured out. So we're going to keep trying, but uh, so far have not figured it out. My attention is probably going to go to the power supply right now. Maybe one of these caps are dead. Then the other big change is you can see all these black wires. There's two here, there's two more here, and there's uh, here, here. Uh, those are all shielded cables. So I think that that helped a lot. One other little tweak, um, this is the gain, the overdrive stage. There were the red arrow, uh, the red wires were from the plates. And these two resistors here come from the high voltage. I actually was running uh, some snubbing capacitors, these two guys, and I might put them back in. But for now I took them out because I wondered if they were contributing. Um, I got some wires going here from the phase inverter to the power tubes. So I just think it's getting a little dicey having those capacitors there. So all those things together have got the amp to where it is. I think I've improved it a fair bit from the first fire up. So let's go ahead and test it out. Another thing that I kind of came across was the idea that this might be related to the power supply. If you do some re some Googling for just the idea of ghosting in a guitar amp, the, a lot of it will point you towards the power supply, maybe a bad filter cap or something just isn't quite right there. Now, I was at work when I got this tip and I looked over a picture in really close detail and I thought I saw that my second filter cap was wired backwards. So, hallelujah, we figured it out. I got home and I take another close look and it was like a glitch of the wire of the, the lighting bouncing off something and shining and making it look like that negative white stripe was on the top side when really it actually was just hidden kind of underneath the bottom. So I went from elation thinking I had figured it out to total dejection again thinking I'm back stuck in the troubleshooting quagmire that I had found myself in. So I took a little closer look at my filter caps. These are $1 filter caps from Mauser. They're United Chemicon, and they're 450 volt, 27 microfarad. Now 450 volts is probably a little bit low considering I just said I got 500 volts coming off my rectifier. We'll maybe address that later, but um, I just had some concern maybe that these are cheap and I got a bad one in there somewhere. So my idea was to, um, I had a, probably six more of these new in my bag of parts, I measured them all on my parts tester and they all measured out fine. So I thought I would take them out one at a time from the existing amp, take them out, put in a new one that's known working fresh and just see if I could troubleshoot it that way. Okay guys, I think I solved my ghosting problem. I'm fairly certain it was related to this bias cap here. This guy. Little stinker. I got a new one in now and I think that cleared my bias issues right up, and I also think it was related to this filter cap right here not being seated very well. I think that was causing the ghosting, and I think this was causing kind of an inconsistent bias. But, um, yeah, I actually just got done biasing the tubes, and this thing is ready to roll. I'm really excited to hear it play. Unfortunately, my girls are all asleep, so I'm going to have to wait till tomorrow, but... This thing is going to be sweet. I'm really pumped to hear how it sounds. When I got to the first one, 
this is my B plus five note. So the very last note in the step down chain, and there's a long wire that runs all the way to the far end of the amp to supply B plus to the V1 input tube. And lo and behold, that wire I had taken out because the way I needed to route through, I, it wasn't long enough on my first bill pass through. And you, I think that would, that was, you'll see that in part two, if you go back and look. And what happened was when I put in the new wire, I pushed it through the eyelet to solder it in place. And when I did that, I actually pushed the lead of the filter cap out of the eyelet. And so, and then I soldered it and then it just hardened in place for after 10 seconds. So basically the, you know, if, if this is the eyelet hole, I, I pushed the wire, one wire in from this way, it pushed, you know, if, if my J hook is coming this way, it pushes it out. So it's basically just resting up against the solder on the side of that eyelet. And it wasn't actually going through the eyelet and making any kind of physical mechanical connection. And so instantly, once I desoldered it, 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 it didn't really even need a desolder, it just kind of like came unstuck. So it was really clear that it was not getting a very strong connection with that filter cap. So um, I ended up, I actually didn't even pull it out. I just gave it a proper soldering. I pushed it through the eyelet hole and pulled it up tight and curled it under a little bit, making a solid mechanical connection, soldered that bad boy up. Second, with that same troubleshooting pass, I was looking again at my bias circuit because when I was drawing my layout, I noticed that my bias filter capacitor looked weird. Like the, the shell, the, the printed part on the outside of the capacitor had kind of come off of the body of the cap and it just was looking very strange. So I decided to pull that out of circuit, put it on my parts tester and was really reading really goofy. It was reading inconsistent. It was reading really low. Should have been a 50 volt, 50 microfarad. And it was reading like eight or 16 or 12 or it was off. So I just decided that maybe that had gotten nuked when I um, had installed it previously or somehow put in a new one in its place. And those two changes were the breakthrough. Those two changes were the success moment that I needed. The ghosting, I think, was because of the first filter cap not making contact. And the inconsistent and weird bias readings and the current being way too high was because it wasn't being properly filtered. And, you know, maybe those two other issues are even related amongst themselves. So fixing those two things was a huge breakthrough. Um... I went back through, I added my negative feedback again, I added my capacitor snubbers again, and even having all that shielded cable in there actually has made the amp super quiet. And that was really the big breakthrough that I needed. And uh, now we're, we're caught up to the present where I've got the amp to a really nice working condition. I've got the tubes biased really nicely, and I think it sounds fantastic. So uh, let's go ahead and check out a really sweet tone demo. I'm really pleased with how this turned out.
So I hope you guys enjoyed that tone clip. I'm really thrilled with this amp. It is extremely fun to play. Um, there still are even some further tweaks I'm considering. I could probably use to stiffen up the power supply a little bit more, um, considering adding some more beefier filter caps, because if my B plus pushes 500 volts, I probably need more than 450 volt filter caps on the first couple nodes. Um, contemplating adding a choke and maybe even some higher value filter caps. Right now they're 27 microfarad at the first stage, considering more like 100, or maybe even you know, 150, 200, um, just for a really stiff feel, uh, more in that dumble line. Um, also, I still haven't even added the clean and overdrive switch, and I don't have any relay switching yet. So while I will say this, though, the amp is perfectly usable just as a drive channel. And actually, you can get a really nice clean tone if you keep the input volume down at 9 o'clock and the drive control from the drive channel all down at 9 o'clock and then crank the master all the way up. It actually sounds really killer and it's a super nice clean tone. Um, so I don't know. I might just leave it just as a drive channel and just play it like that. You know, I've got enough clean amps here behind me. I, I, you know, I think the main attraction of this is it's really killer drive tone. And, you know, there are even a couple other tweaks that I might look into, but um, overall, I'm really pleased with where the amp is at. The tone functionality is fantastic. Having the presence control, uh, the three-band EQ, and the jazz rock switch is fantastic. I really enjoy that. The jazz mode is definitely quieter. It's a big drop in gain, but it changes the frequency response in a pretty significant way. Just the interaction of the bass and treble controls really changes significantly. And you can get a totally kind of different feel. And you can compensate by raising the input gain a little bit and still get a similar level of distortion. So as a whole, I'm really, really thrilled with this amp. Let me know your comments, thoughts, and, and, and down in the, let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. I'd love to hear from you guys. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, Part three, this has been quite a journey, and I'm thrilled to have the amp working where it's at now. So please come back again soon. I'll see you guys for the next episode. Thanks. Bye.